Hello occultists. If you don't already know who I am, my name is Ivy and today we're going to be discussing the Hermetic Kabbalah. We're going to first talk about some different spelling variations. You may see Kabbalah spelled with a K, a C, or a Q and so we are going to discuss those variations and what they mean. We're also going to discuss the Tree of Life. I'm going to walk you through the 10 Sephira on the Tree of Life. We're going to discuss pathworking and then at the end of this video I am going to give you some book recommendations so you can further your research on this subject. So without further ado, let's begin. The first thing that we need to do is to discuss why there are so many different spelling variations for Kabbalah and what all these different spellings typically mean. Let's discuss the differences between Kabbalah with a K, Kabbalah with a C, and Kabbalah with a Q. Kabbalah is the practice of traditional Jewish mysticism. It derives from the ancient Jewish practices of biblical texts mixed with prophecy, magic, etc. This version of Kabbalah was historically practiced by Jewish men over 40, and there were actually a lot of restrictions towards who was actually allowed to practice this secret tradition. I think it's become more inclusive today, but the original Kabbalah is still typically practiced by people of Jewish faith. Kabbalah with a C typically refers to the Christian adaptation of the original Jewish Kabbalah. This does typically require the practitioner to be of Christian faith. When there is a C present, think of Christian. Hermetic Kabbalah is open to anyone of any faith and has more of an emphasis on the magical part of the original Kabbalah. It is a more modern practice that has influences from the original Jewish Kabbalah, Egyptian and Roman magic, Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, Western astrology, paganism, etc. Most non-Jewish and non-Christian practitioners today practice Kabbalah with a Q, also known as Hermetic Kabbalah, and you do not have to be of any faith to practice Hermetic Kabbalah. The rest of this video will be dedicated to Hermetic Kabbalah specifically. I always recommend learning Hermetic Kabbalah to people interested in tarot, astrology, and ceremonial magic, particularly if you are interested in the Golden Dawn style of ceremonial magic because it is hidden in the foundations of these practices. And so, learning about the Hermetic Kabbalah can deepen your tarot, astrology, and ceremonial magic practices. Let's begin with the most basic question, what is Hermetic Kabbalah? Hermetic Kabbalah is a way of viewing the entire universe, all the way from the stars and planets in the sky, down to the way neurons create pathways inside your brain. In the simplest terms possible, Kabbalah is a mystical system that describes the creation of the world. It also describes our relationship to source, which is the energy in which we all derive from, and the means by which we may achieve a kind of union with that source. Hermetic Kabbalah is a philosophy, but it's also a magical practice. You can use Kabbalah to make talismans, invoke powerful energies during ritual, etc. And Hermetic Kabbalah also involves pathworking through the Tree of Life. But what is pathworking and what is the Tree of Life? We are going to discuss both of these concepts in this video. Let's start with the Tree of Life, and I am going to be referring to some of my notes throughout this process because I want to make sure that I don't miss any information. There is a lot that we're going to go through, but this is the Tree of Life. It looks like a map, and it basically is. It's kind of like a map of the entire universe. It consists of 10 Sephirah. You can see the 10 Sephirah here, these spheres. And there are also 22 pathways that travel in between all the 10 Sephirah. You can see the pathways here. The 10 Sephirah represent certain archetypal energies and you use the paths to enter each archetypal energy, if that makes sense. Pathworking basically refers to the movement along these paths as you move from one Sephirah to another. And this is typically done through guided meditation. What you do is you start from the bottom and you slowly move up the tree as you go deeper and deeper into your meditations. But we're going to get to pathworking a little bit later in this video. 
Now at the very top of the tree, we have Kether. This represents source and pure divinity. It is basically the beginning of all life and all energy. It's the highest thing that can be perceived by our human consciousness, and we can't really grasp it because it is infinite. Kether represents infinite potential and creation, but it also represents nothingness, as nothing's been created yet. And there's a um, there's a bit in the ancient Hebrew texts of the Sefer Yetzirah where there is this passage that states, Kether is the light giving the power of comprehension of that first principle which has no beginning. It is the primal glory because no created being can attain its essence. Next, we move to Hokma, which is translated as wisdom. This is the first tangible thing that our human minds can actually begin to grasp, and it represents, it basically represents male energy or yang energy, and it's described as the all father. Whereas Kether represents nothingness and the potential for creation, Hokma is the first glimmer of that creation. A lot of people are familiar in biblical texts, we are familiar with the phrase, let there be light. And that is exactly what Hokma represents. Much like Kether, this is still a very, very difficult thing for us to grasp as Hokma is the seed of life, the beginning of creation. Next, we move to Bina, which translates to understanding. Bina is the third sphere which mirrors Hokma, and it represents the womb of creation. She is the divine mother. She represents true understanding of our entire universe. Bina receives the disorganized chaos from Hokma and turns it into some sort of form and stability. Now, without Bina, we would have nothing because no form would have been created from the chaos. Both Hokma and Bina are balanced by Keter. Moving on to the fourth sphere, we have Hesed, which translates to mercy and loving kindness. It represents the fundamental aspects of goodness and how our creation came into being, whereas Bina, our mother, gave us some sort of form from the chaos of Hokma, Hesed gives us the framework from which we will build our entire manifested universe. All spiritual virtues reside here. Cosmic laws also reside here that concern fairness, peace, order, etc. Hesed is definitely a lot easier for us to understand than the first three spheres here. Now moving on to the fifth sphere, we have Gebura, which is the partner to Hesed. Gebura represents strength because it is responsible for carrying out the cosmic law imposed by Hesed. So karma and justice resides here as Gebura corrects any sort of imbalances in our universe. And during your pathworking meditations, you might actually find that Gebura is extremely useful in helping you actually achieve your goals. Um, for example, let's say you want to become more happy. Gebura would come into your life like a flaming justice warrior and help you remove any imbalances in your life that are making you un happy. While Hokma and Bina are balanced by Keter, Hesed and Gebera are balanced by Tiferat. The sixth sphere is Tiferat. It is the center of the tree and it's connected to every other sphere on the tree. Tiferat translates to beauty and it represents the interconnectedness of life. All life is beautiful and unique while also being interwoven. And remember that Hokma and Bina are considered the divine mother and father? Well, Tifara is their love child. On the tree of life, we are now beginning to move from thought forms and ideas to physical and tangible things. Now we are moving to the lower spheres, which relate to our tangible human experience. And the seventh sphere is Netzach. Netzach translates to victory and triumph over obstacles. It represents all possibilities, how we might experience, perceive, or feel something. It's the balance between individual and collective energies, and it's our intuition and our emotions. That is key when remembering Netzach. It's basically our intuition and our emotions. Next, we have Hod right over here, which is the counterpart to Netzach. While Netzach was our intuition and our emotions, Hod is our mental thought processes. Hod takes all the intuition and emotions from Netzach and turns it into tangible and comprehensive thought forms. For example, when you feel something, that happens in Netzach. But when you try to understand or comprehend that feeling, you are moving into Hod. 
Hode translates to glory and splendor because all glory and splendor is a mental construct. And Hode also plays a huge role in the development of our personality and ego. Therefore, Hode is great to work with when you are attempting to work with your ego. So both Hode and Netzach are balanced by the next sphere, which is Yesod. Yesod translates to foundation because it's basically where all the emanations connect with our physical reality. Yesod is where mind and matter actually start to connect. And then we have the 10th sphere down at the bottom, which is the final sephirah, and this is Malhut, which is our physical reality. It is the four elements, our mundane world, etc. So where Malhut represents our physical reality, Yesod can be considered the astral plane. Now, Malhut translates to kingdom because it represents all life on earth. It represents the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, etc. Anything having to do with our mundane, physical, practical reality. Okay, so now that we have discussed a little bit about each of the 10 sephira, let's look at the tree of life as a whole. Malhut relates to the planet Earth, Yesod relates to the moon, Hod relates to the planet Mercury, Netzach relates to the planet Venus, Tiferet relates to the sun, Yabira relates to Mars, Hesed relates to Jupiter, Bina relates to Saturn, Hokma and Kether up at the top do not have any planetary associations as they are the beginning of creation, but Hokma is said to rule the entire zodiac. There are also angels that relate to each Sephira, and there are colors, correspondences for each Sephira, there are tarot cards that are associated to certain pathways in the Tree of Life, you know, throughout the different pathways. Um, there are some Kabbalistic practitioners that even combine the chakra system and the Tree of Life as well, which uses the tree of life to focus on specific areas of the body. So I wanted to show you this. So as you can see here, each sphere relates to a different part of the body. So we have base of the spine here, pelvic area, left hip, right hip, heart, left shoulder, right shoulder, left brain, right brain, and crown. And then you have the third eye in the center here. There are so many different variations of the Tree of Life, and these are just two examples that I'm showing you here today. But basically, Kabbalah is very, very complex, and it goes much deeper than what we are discussing today. What you need to know for right now is that you can actually use these different archetypal energies in your spells or rituals by invoking the energies that they represent or by evoking the spiritual entities tied to them. This is obviously a massive oversimplification of the process, but you get the idea. But now that we've discussed the basics of the Ten Sephiroth and the Tree of Life, let's discuss pathworking. Pathworking is done through guided meditation, and it is the movement from one Sephiroth to another. You can see the pathways here. Obviously, they move in very specific ways. There are 22 specific pathways within the Tree of Life, and there is a whole method on how you do this, which I won't be going to in this video. But if you are interested in a pathworking video, please let me know in the comments below, because I would love to discuss this a little bit more in detail. But I did want to say, when you are in a deep meditative space and working through these spheres, you can gain insight on how to better pretty much everything around you. It allows you to access different dimensions inside your own mind, and different frequencies in your external environment. So pathworking meditations, they contain specific triggers to access these archetypal energies of the 10 Sephiroth. And even if you're not using this as a philosophy or a way to gain enlightenment, you can use it for simple spells and rituals as well. You can use it for money spells. You can use it for making talismans. You can use these archetypal energies for pretty much anything you want. So in conclusion, up until this point, we have kind of discussed what Hermetic Kabbalah is. We've discussed the tree of life just very, very briefly, as well as what it means to perform pathworking. But now we are going to move on to some book recommendations. So as you can see, the Hermetic Kabbalah can be used for a bunch of different things. It can be a system used to reach enlightenment. It can be a system used for magical purposes with creating talismans or even healing certain parts of the body. There are so many uses for the Kabbalah. You can even use it to improve your psychic gifts, to practice astral projection, or to better a financial situation. The possibilities are endless, but we're going to talk about some book recommendations recommendations now and I have nine books here. Nine 
books that I am going to breeze through. We're going to work through these really quickly, but I wanted to give you a well-rounded book recommendation list. So let's start first with the books that are best for beginners, because if you are a beginner entering the world of Hermetic Kabbalah, you need something that's beginner friendly because this system gets very, very complex. So the first two books that I would recommend for a beginner are these two here. So the first one is The Chicken Kabbalah, and this is by Lon Milo Duquette. This one is often recommended um, by so many other occultists and Kabbalists because it is funny, it's witty, the author kind of takes a complex subject and just makes it fun to read about, so it's a really enjoyable read. So definitely check out The Chicken Kabbalah. But my personal favorite for beginners is this Simplified Kabbalah Magic by Ted Andrews. Um, my ring light is kind of giving a glare on my books right now. Oh. Okay, over here. <laughs> that seems to work best. But I don't know why this book isn't recommended more. Maybe it's just because people haven't read it, but I actually really, really enjoyed this book. This book was the first book for me that actually made things click, and I was like, oh, I actually understand it now. So yes, even though I love the Chicken Kabbalah and it's recommended by a lot of people, I personally liked this simpl Simplified Kabbalah Magic book a little bit better. Just that's a personal preference. Whichever book you go with, you're gonna be you're gonna be well off for sure. So those are the two books that I would recommend for a beginner. And then once you get to the point where you want to deep dive and you're starting to get really serious about your Kabbalah practice, you're gonna have to read some classics. So the next three books are considered classics or staples in any Kabbalistic practice. The first one is by Dion Fortune. This one's called The Mystical Kabbalah. And this one, this is a book that's referred to in so many other books on Kabbalah. So it's good to just go back to the original source and read it for yourself. So if you're getting serious about Kabbalah, you got to read this book at some point. And the next two books are by Israel Rigardi. So we have the, the Tree of Life here. Oh my gosh, that glare is terrible. The Tree of Life and the Middle Pillar. So both of these books are classics. They are staples. You absolutely need to read these books. Again, like the Dion Fortune book, these ones are gonna be referred to a lot in other um, Kabbalistic books. So you have to go back to the source, read these for sure. Um, and again, if you're being, you know, getting a little bit more serious in your Kabbalistic practice, these are the ones for you. And then we move on to additional books that are just fun, that will kind of well round your Kabbalah practice. So the next one that I'm going to recommend is Magical States of Consciousness. This is by Denning and Phillips. I have um, another book by them and I really like um, how they organize their um, content. This one is excellent for pathworking specifically, entering altered states of consciousness, etc. Um, this book I haven't finished yet, but it is excellent so far. I definitely recommend this when you want to deep dive into pathworking a little bit more. And this book does come highly recommended by a lot of other occult um, people that I know uh, that I really, really respect. So this one definitely comes highly recommended by a lot of occultists. So definitely check out Magical States of Consciousness. And then this next one, it's called Energy Healing with the Kabbalah. And this one is by Debbie Stern. I think that's how you pronounce her first name. I'm not really sure. But this book is so interesting. I loved it. So it combines the Kabbalah with energy med medicine, physical movement, um, and it essentially helps you combine grounding techniques, creating boundaries, connecting to the cosmos, sacred sex, physiology, etc. So if you're interested in using the Kabbalah or the Kabbalah as a way of connecting to your physical body and healing certain points within the body, this is probably going to be the book for you. Um, I just really, really enjoyed this book and it's been a while since I read it and I probably need to reread it because there's a lot of information here. All of these books are books that you need to like reread multiple times. <laughs> so definitely check out this book. 
And the last two books I haven't read yet, but I really wanted to share them with you all because they look so interesting. So this one is called Shamanic Kabbalah, and this is by Daniel Moeller, um, A Mystical Path to Uniting the Tree of Life and the Great Work. I have never seen a shamanic Kabbalah book before that combines shamanism and Kabbalah, so I'm really, really interested to read this. I have no idea if it's going to be good or not. If you've read this book, let me know in the comments what your opinion is. Um, and then the last one is called Kabbalah for the Modern World. So this, I do not know how to pronounce that person's last name, so I'm going to show you up on the screen this book. I'm so sorry for the glare on my ring light. The lighting in this room is just really terrible and I try to make it better, but here we are. Anyways, um, so this book looks really interesting because it's the first book to present the Kabbalah from a scientific orientation to show how it relates to such modern scientific models as quantum theory, chaos theory, relativity, black holes, and dark matter. How cool is that? So this is, sounds like it's definitely more science-based. I love anything to do with um, chaos uh, theory, you know, quantum theory, relativity, all that stuff. So I cannot wait to read this one. Again, if you have read this one, let me know in the comments how, what your experience was with it. But those are the nine books that I would um, recommend, even though the last two I haven't read yet, but just to well-round your Kabbalistic practice. I hope that this video was helpful for you as a beginner or even maybe as an intermediate Kabbalistic practitioner, definitely let me know your thoughts um, in the comments below and also if you would like to see additional videos on Kabbalah as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in a video very soon. Bye!